For over a century, a single theory has dominated our understanding of ancient Indian civilization. Known as the Aryan Invasion Theory, it presented a seemingly straightforward narrative. Around 1500 BCE, nomadic Indo-Aryan tribes swept into the Indian subcontinent, bringing with them Sanskrit, the Vedas, and what would become Hinduism. This theory claimed that these invaders conquered the indigenous Dravidian civilization, pushing them southward, and established the caste system that would define Indian society for millennia. But science is telling a dramatically different story. The roots of the Aryan invasion theory lie not in archaeological evidence or scientific discovery, but in the colonial mindset of 19th century Western scholars. These academics, led by philologist Max Muller, interpreted India's ancient texts through a distinctly colonial lens. Operating under assumptions of European superiority, they concluded that the sophisticated culture they encountered in India must have been imported by external conquerors rather than developed by the indigenous population. This theory conveniently aligned with the broader colonial narrative that indigenous people were incapable of developing sophisticated cultures on their own. It reflected the racial prejudices of the time, fitting neatly into pseudo-scientific racial hierarchies that placed the Europeans at the top. The theory served as an academic justification for colonial rule, suggesting that India had always been shaped by outside invaders, that India had always been ruled by outside invaders. But modern archaeology has uncovered a very different picture. At the Bhirana site in northern India, researchers have made a stunning discovery. Evidence of an advanced civilization dating back at least 9,500 years. This makes the Indian civilization older than both ancient Mesopotamia and Egypt, traditionally considered the world's earliest civilizations. Along the now dry riverbed of the ancient Saraswati River, archaeologists have identified over 500 settlement sites. These sites tell a story not of a sudden invasion and collapse, but of gradual adaptation to changing environmental conditions. The Saraswati, once a mighty river extensively mentioned in the ancient Indian texts, began its gradual decline around 3000 BCE, well before the supposed Aryan invasion. The archaeological record shows no evidence of the widespread destruction or sudden cultural changes that usually accompany a massive invasion. Instead, it reveals a pattern of cultural continuity stretching back thousands of years. Perhaps the most compelling evidence comes from the field of genetics. Recent studies have revealed that the R1A1A haplogroup, a genetic marker long associated with Indo-European people, actually originated in India more than 15,000 years ago. This discovery completely reverses our understanding of prehistoric migration patterns. Rather than showing evidence of a massive population influx around 1500 BCE, Genetic studies reveal no significant outside genetic influence in India for the past 10 to 15,000 years. Even more remarkably, these studies show no substantial genetic differences between North and South Indians, demolishing the concept of an Aryan Dravidian divide that was central to the invasion theory. The R1A1A haplogroup would become one of the most successful genetic lineages in human history with hundreds of millions of descendants across Eurasia today. But instead of marking the arrival of invaders into India, it appears to mark expansions out of India. Because the evidence suggests a pattern of movement in the opposite direction, instead of an invasion into India. This westward expansion of Indian origin people can be traced through both genetic and linguistic evidence. For instance, archaeological discoveries from the ancient kingdom of Mitanni in Syria provide tangible evidence of this westward expansion of Indian culture. Clay tablets found in Boskale, Turkey, dated to around 1380 BCE, record treaties sworn in the name of Vedic gods Indra, Mitra, Nasatya and Varuna. 
a horse training manual from this region written by a master named Kikuli uses Sanskrit terminology throughout. The Rig Veda, widely considered the world's oldest text, has been dated to around the time of this supposed invasion. However, its detailed descriptions of the Saraswati as a mighty flowing river suggests that it must have been composed much earlier. Given that geological studies show that the river began drying up between 2 to 3000 BCE, the text likely dates back to around 5000 BCE or earlier when the Saraswati was last in its prime. Archaeological evidence reveals remarkable continuity in Indian cultural practices. Many traditions and customs found in ancient Sindhu Saraswati civilization continue to exist in modern India. These include practices such as yoga, the use of vermilion in married women's hair partition, certain types of bangles and various religious symbols and customs and chants and prayers. This cultural continuity combined with the genetic and archaeological evidence suggests that modern Indian civilization is not the product of an invasion or of a migration, but rather represents an unbroken tradition stretching back at least 9,500 years according to archaeological evidence and possibly 15,450 years according to genetic studies. The mounting scientific evidence forces us to fundamentally rethink our understanding of Indian civilization. Rather than being a product of invasion and conquest, India appears to be the world's oldest continuously existing civilization. The evidence suggests that both the people and their cultural traditions have remained remarkably consistent over millennia, adapting gradually to changing conditions rather than experiencing sudden disruptions. This new understanding has profound implications for how we view the development of human civilization itself. It suggests that sophisticated urban cultures could develop indigenously without external influence and that the spread of culture and technology could occur through gradual expansion and exchange rather than through invasion and conquest. Despite the growing weight of scientific evidence, the Aryan invasion theory continues to be taught in many Indian schools and universities. This persistence can be partly explained by the theory's deep entrenchment in academic and political discourse. The theory has served as a powerful political tool, dovetailing with various political narratives and being used to divide India into dichotomous categories. North and South Indians, Aryans and Dravidians, the fair-skinned and the dark-skinned, high castes and Dalits, the privileged and the oppressed. The challenge now lies in updating educational materials and academic discourse to reflect the new scientific understanding of India's past. What was once seen as a civilization born from invasion now appears to be something far more remarkable. A civilization that developed indigenously over many thousands of years, maintaining cultural continuity while gradually adapting to changing conditions. The evidence from archaeology, genetics, linguistics and geology all points to the same conclusion. The Aryan invasion theory, born in the colonial era, does not match the scientific evidence. In its place emerges a picture of a civilization marked by continuity rather than disruption, indigenous development rather than external imposition, and gradual adaptation rather than sudden change. The evidence suggests that Indian civilization deserves to be studied not as a product of invasion and conquest, but as one of humanity's oldest continuously existing civilizations.